It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to a special episode of Science on Top. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Lucas Randall. Hello, Ed. And today we have the good fortune to be chatting with astrophysicist Dr. Katie Mack. Welcome back. Hello, thank you. It's good to be back. It's great yeah. to have you so on. I just feel that we need fanfare. <laughs> we need some fanfare. Like the Muppets in the background sort of yeah, waving their arms around. It's always nice to have you on the show, Katie. Thank you. It is, but usually when you're on, it's to explain the latest thoughts of Professor Stephen Hawking or some <laughs> new uh, gravitational wave discovery or something like that. But I thought we might sit down and just focus on something just as equally fascinating, which is you, because you're a very busy, accomplished person who's doing all sorts of interesting things. I think we should start with your exciting new job that you're about to start later this year in the States. Is that right? Yeah. So it officially starts January 1st. Mm -hmm. And the job is a tenure track uh, assistant professorship at North Carolina State University. So it's, um, it's a normal tenure track job in the sense that I will start as an assistant professor and um, I'll be teaching some classes. I'll be doing my research. But it's also part of this new initiative that North Carolina State has, which is the Leadership in Public Science Cluster. So they have a number of people from different disciplines in science who are doing their own research and their own science stuff. And then there's some people in communication as well. And uh, they're bringing us all together to do new and interesting public science projects. So that might be public engagement. It might be uh, researching how people think about science, um, all of those kinds of things. So I'm, I'm really excited about it. I think it'll be really fun. Yeah. It seems um, really up your alley as well. It, yes. That's exactly yes, what I was just thinking. So. You're perfect for this. So have I already got something wrong? Should it be, uh, should I have introduced you as Professor Katie Mack then? No, no, so I'm still, I'm, I'm not, I'm not professor until I get there, um, until I start officially on January 1st. So I'm still just a postdoc, um, here in Australia. Oh, just a postdoc, she said. Just a postdoc, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, technic one. I'm technically a Castro Co-op Research Fellow in Theoretical Cosmology, I think is my full job title. But I, I'm also, I think, still a Discovery Early Career Researcher Award, uh, fellow. I don't yeah. know. There's only so much models. room on a business card, Katie. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you are all of the things. <laughs> um, okay, Including so one of the uh, one of the favorite targets of the of the Twitter outraged oh. old white dudes. That, that <laughs> seems to be that seems to be another one of the feathers in your cap. I think the latest um, one was a. Oh, no, I, I won't steal your thunder. What's the latest one? Oh, I was just I was. Um, I was saying something on Twitter about being sad that that so many people seem to believe that climate scientists are just, you know, um, making stuff up for money and and all of that. And then um, it might have been it might have been sarcastic, but somebody said that uh, you know that I'm only saying that because I'm a money grubbing, lying uh, uh, yeah. science journalist. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so and, was, I, and I, I wondered the same whether it was sarcastic because you seemed to sort of change the order of the the words that you had used. Um, yeah, so. I, I'm. Yeah, I'm, I'm never. You know, it's it's kind of hard to tell. The thing is that those kinds of like I I get I get that stuff sincerely often enough. It's kind mm, of hard yeah. to say, and it's not funny um, when yeah. people do yeah. that stuff as a joke. And so it's like. Whatever you know, because earlier, um, earlier in the same conversation, somebody else had said that that um, I was whoring out for grants, and uh, somebody else was uh, was uh, just talking about um, scientists all being liars, and you know, and those 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 ones were uh, were sincere. So it's kind of hard to say. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Probably sorry, your, sorry uh, to bring down the tone of the uh, discussion. No. <laughs> Well, I think let's bring it up slightly because I think your most um, 
famous internet moment, I guess you'd say, was uh, your, <laughs> it's been described as the epic smackdown. Uh, and I think JK Rowling said it uh, validated the very existence of Twitter. Uh, you, yeah. you basically tweeted your well-founded fears about climate change. I'm noticing it's always about yeah. climate change. That's, <laughs> that's what gets that's what gets people really riled up. It's it's uh, it's interesting. And then this conservative, I'm guessing an internet troll, responded with, "Well, why don't you learn some science then?" And you just pointed out that you have a PhD in freaking astrophysics. <laughs> <laughs> So well I thought it would that. be overkill to go further. I just <laughs> love that too much. <laughs> it was a, that was such a weird moment as well because, you know, I get I get a lot of comments like that and I I usually ignore them um, and sometimes I just block people immediately so that I don't have to worry about it. But um, but uh, in that occasion, I, like every once in a while, I'll reply if I find it amusing to do so, and so I. I just replied that and like I think I was like walking toward the bathroom when I was typing this out on my phone and I sort of chuckled to myself and then I and then I forgot about it and then a few hours later I noticed that somehow people had noticed this reply and were retweeting it and then it's and when it got to 150 retweets I was like okay this is odd and then I was uh I was out having some some tea with somebody later on and I saw the JK Rowling thing and my phone just exploded <laughs> oh gosh <laughs> and it was uh and I think I think my my Twitter following went up by 100% that week wow. just doubled in a week <laughs> um because uh JK Rowling so uh she has some influence it turns out so, it's funny that. <laughs> yeah. And so do yeah. you now. <laughs> so there are some good moments being on Twitter, but a lot of the time, and especially for women, it's a very yeah. nasty place. And I mean, yet the thing is, you like, persisted. I think, I think uh, you know, I think for the most part, um, Twitter is great. I mean, I it, it gives me a chance to talk about science with uh, a lot of people who are really interested in it. Um, it gets me. It gives me a chance to be, um, you know, a scientist who is accessible to people who are not in science, who are not connected to academia. That's really important to me. Um, you know, the whole thing about being a visible woman in science is helpful. Like that's good. Um, and you know, I've made a lot of friends through Twitter, and I've connected with some really amazing, interesting people through Twitter. So, like you know, 90% of it is, is awesome. I've really, you know, I'm really happy that I found Twitter and that I've been able to, you know, do some stuff in that space, you know, and, and it, but it also, you know, it's, uh, when you're, when you're visible and when you talk about things that people have feelings about, then, then, you know, it's bound to get people riled up. So, so there, you know, there are some bad things that happen and, you know, talking about climate change or feminism, uh, turns out those are things that people get very upset about, um, and uh, you know, other there are other kinds of topics like that 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 for some reason just really really uh, hit people's buttons. So there's you know I think that it's one of these it's one of these unfortunate things that if you are somebody who goes on Twitter and talks about any of these topics people find um, polarizing, you know, um, stuff like climate change or like um, racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, any of these kinds of topics, um, uh, you can get backlash. And, and occasionally, every once in a while, it'll get really, really bad. And I think that um, that's, that's something that a lot of those of us who are on Twitter and who um, who do talk about, you know, important issues sometimes we just have to kind of accept that this is something that can happen yeah. that like you can get piled on by a huge number of people you might run the risk of um getting doxxed or something like that and and these are are really bad things and twitter should be much better at dealing with them but because twitter is not particularly good at dealing with these things all the time that because they they have a problem with uh, abuse on the platform this is just this is a thing that that can happen and it's it's a bummer that people have to you know kind of weigh that stuff up like do i want to expose myself to these kinds of things or do i want to be quiet you know and and i've been really lucky really i mean i've only had a little bit of um of abuse on the platform in terms of like stuff that would be actually concerning mm -hmm. but uh you know i have friends who 
like strangers have shown up at their doors and stuff like that based on abuse they got on Twitter. I mean, like really scary things. So, yeah, yeah. I yeah, think you, so, you, I you seem to deal with it exceptionally well, though. Like your, you know, those, <laughs> those comebacks that you do occasionally indulge in are, are, are not personal attacks. They're not, you know, ranting. You, they, they, it, it seems as though you're kind of, you're responding sort of ironically a lot of the time. And it's, it's just, um, I think it's one of those things that as a, as a scientist who, who I guess is, is one of those scientists who are kind of defining and allow me to say this, cause this is my, my, my feeling about you. You're kind of defining what it means to be engaged with the public as you sort of plodding your way through your career. Do you know what I mean? Like you're, you're uh-huh. different to a lot of other scientists in that way. And I think the way that you, you do engage is is part of what what makes you so fascinating to people because you're humanizing it you know in such a it's like you you've you've managed to make this brand for yourself which is just you you're just being you but but you're doing it in such a way that it's just uh, attractive to people to you know to follow your journey that, that's how i sort of view it anyway i don't know what point well, i'm making yeah i've gone off on a tangent that's that's very kind of you to say i appreciate that i mean i i do i do try to diffuse uh more than more than anything else when when somebody's really angry and mean um mm. But that I, is so important, I think, that whole idea of being positive and not denigrating the other people. We're seeing it a lot in this marriage equality debate now of mm-hmm. people who are the, the feeling like they're being talked down to and they're automatically a bigot just because they don't agree with you. It doesn't change minds is, I think, what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Well, I mean, I you know, I, I don't think that I don't think that we ever have the right to tell somebody who is being attacked, who is being denigrated, that they should take it with a smile. I don't think that's ever um, something that, that we have, that anybody has a right to ask someone else that they should, that they should be cheerful and, and welcoming and, you know, friendly um, when somebody is being horrible to them. For my, in my uh, space though, like, because I'm reasonably sheltered and privileged in a number of ways, I, and and because I have the energy to deal with this stuff, I I feel like you know, I I have the ability to just you know um, to just try and diffuse things to not blow up at people, um, and that's my impl- inclination. But I, I don't think we should hold everybody to that because sometimes like it's you know it's bad enough that you know people get abuse constantly. We can't go around saying like oh, and you have to be really happy about it too. <laughs> you know, like no, yeah, that's yeah. never no. right. No. So. You know, I mean, so for me, like, I I have other ways to um, to blow off steam about people who are nasty to me online. Um, I have, you know, like secret accounts where I rant, and I have, <laughs> I have I send screenshots to my friends and say, "Look at this horrible person! Look at what they said to me!" You know, I I have other ways, um, but uh, but I do find that that um, that it's. It's easiest for me when you know in the in the public forum that is Twitter uh, to to try to stay pretty uh, you know to keep a sort of outward calm. I also find though that occasionally, like if somebody says something inappropriate, occasionally I'll say like that was a terribly inappropriate thing to say, and they'll be like, "Oh, I'm so sorry." <laughs> so I think yeah. that I think that I, I think that I do. I I have managed to occasionally like give enough of an impression that like I will crush you (laughs) (laughs) that people are very quick to uh, apologize (laughs) so that 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 could be really fun (laughs) wield your power wisely (laughs) yeah yeah it doesn't always happen but sometimes yeah I I, um I I wanted to to ask you a little bit about the eclipse because I know you kind of had you set off with a with a I, I'm a serious <laughs> scientist and I'm going to talk about the science here and oh my god it's so beautiful sort of moment can you can you tell me about your experience a little bit oh the the eclipse was amazing I I went to see it in um, in um, Missouri and I went with some friends and we were mostly in places with no uh, like cellular coverage and stuff so uh so i i knew that i wasn't going to be able to like live tweet it or you know anything else but i also just kind of wanted to just go and experience it and not um not make it like a a public thing i just i thought you know like this is supposed to be an amazing experience i want to you know just leave it for myself and be 
on a little vacation. I, I officially put on my, you know, requested vacation time from work so that I could do this thing. And, you know, I, I it was funny because I, I, you know, I had been tweeting a lot about like how eclipses work and like what you should do in terms of like eye protection and stuff like that and, and, and all of those things. And, um, and as an astrophysicist, like I know, like, I mean, the physics is very simple. The moon gets, you know, goes in front of the sun from our perspective. Like, that's all that's happening. Um, but, like, you know, I'm very familiar with, like, how what the corona is and, you know, the celestial mechanics of it and, like, the whole uh, concept. And I've seen photographs of eclipses a million times. And I know all of this, you know, the difference between an annular eclipse and a total eclipse and a lunar eclipse and all this kind of stuff, right? Um, but it was still, like, one of the most like emotional experiences I've ever had in my life. And I, I did not expect that. Like I thought that it mm. would be really cool. I thought it would be like a really cool thing to see, but I didn't expect it to like, you know, take my breath away and make me like, you know, make my, like make me choke up and yeah. feel like I had to sit down, you know, like it was really, really visceral and really affecting in a way that is very hard to explain. Um, yeah, you're right. So, I think everyone yeah. needs to experience a total solar eclipse yeah. for themselves. It's not something you can truly get from seeing photos or watching it on no, YouTube or anything yeah. like that. It's very yeah, it's nothing like the photos are not helpful somehow. Like, I mean, part of it is that it's something that happens to you. Like, there's no there's no other kind of celestial event that happens to you in quite that way. Like, it gets dark around you, you know. Um, like, it gets a little bit colder, like you know, the sounds change because the birds and the insects, you know, get, get confused. So like, there's, there's a lot of stuff that happens that's, that's very local to you that that's very different from just like, you know, watching a meteor shower or something. And then when you look up in the sky and you see this thing that, that somehow you're you, like the instinctive part of your brain knows is not possible (laughs) and just knows is like really, really wrong. And somehow like knowing that it's just really, really wrong, there should not be a hole in the sky. Um, (laughs) You know, that, that uh, really changes your, your perspective. I don't know. It just like, it messes you up. I, I don't know how else to explain it, but it's like, it's kind of, it's very unnerving. It's a little bit scary. Um, and it just like, it, messes with you and that was the similar the people i was with had a very similar experience in terms of like they felt something really strong about it too not, not as much as me i think i was more affected than the others and i'm not sure why because i'm i'm really a pretty level-headed person but <laughs> yeah it just it really got to me just hearing you talk about the the annual uh, solar eclipse and the uh uh, the various different eclipses, sorry, reminded yeah. me of yet another great Katie <laughs> Mac moment on Twitter when you posted the different types of eclipse, including apocalypse. Uh, yeah, and I think yeah. we need to have a greatest moments Katie Mac page somewhere where all your highlights. <laughs> but I didn't want to bring it back to Twitter too much. But yeah, um, no, no, it's okay. So you flew over to the US to do that as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, you travel a lot. I don't know if you know this, but you're always yes. on a plane. <laughs> we yeah, always talk it's been... about the advantages of collaboration and so on, but yeah. does it get you down a lot or do you enjoy it, the traveling side I mean, of things? So the last few months have been particularly um, particularly unreasonable in terms of travel. Um, I don't usually travel quite as much as I do as I have in the last few months um, because because uh, in um, in July I was on this tour of Australia for this it was the Women in Physics lecture tour, and so I went around all of Australia, uh, or not all but almost all of Australia, uh, giving talks in schools and stuff, and um, and then after that I I went on this wild trip to the U.S. and then to a conference in Copenhagen and then into London to work with a collaborator and then back through the U.S. and I had like five hours in LA airport to see my family. And then I went back here. So it's, uh, it's been a lot lately, but in general, I do travel a lot and, you know, I have mixed feelings about it. It's exhausting, obviously, and frequently uncomfortable and, uh, disorienting and, you know, distracts from a lot of things that I need to get done. So, so there are a lot of downsides, but I also find that, 
I get a lot more done if I'm in the same room as my collaborators, and not all of my collaborators are in Melbourne. And so, like for example, when I was in London last week, I, w- I was there to work with a colleague at Imperial College London, and you know, just sitting there at the table in his office for a week, we got much more done on the paper than we had gotten in the last like year um, being in separate places. So. You know, I, it's it's just so much more efficient to be in the same room as someone else, and I get a lot I get a lot out of conferences as well. Like when I go and hear talks by people, I get new ideas, and it kind of reinvigorates the research that I'm doing. And just talking to people about my work, um, I find gives me lots of ideas. So I think that I think it. It's different for different people. Um, some people don't uh, find conferences as useful. Uh, for me, I find it really, really helpful to to talk to people about my research and to talk to people about their research. And um, it's also, you know, obviously useful to go around and give talks about your own stuff because then that sort of spreads the word about your work and you get new collaborations that way and you get, um, you know, people using your ideas and, and all of that kind of thing. So, you know... if in my job and the way that I work, I find the travel really pretty necessary. Like, I don't think that I would be able to get as much interesting science uh, accomplished if I were not traveling a lot. And I also find that, you know, the conferences and things get me much more excited about my work than just being in, you know, in my own department all the time. I mean, you know, in my own department, I get you know, we get colloquia and we get seminars and that's really great. But um, going to conferences and having a room full of people all working on, you know, the same kind of stuff is really helpful. And also, because I work in an area of physics that's kind of on the border between two sub-disciplines, you know, so I I kind of work in theoretical particle physics and also astrophysics, um, I have to kind of go to conferences for each in order to get a perspective on what's what the interesting ideas are in both areas. And so I go to a lot of different kinds of workshops and conferences to get a better idea of where, you know, what the landscape is. And then that helps because a lot of my research is on sort of how to bring together ideas from the theoretical particle physics side and the observational astronomy side and like find new ways to, to test ideas. So for the work I do, it's really, really helpful to have that big picture, broad idea. And then that means I need to, you know, be in touch with all these different communities, which means traveling is really necessary. I mean, the thing is, like, ideally, you know, because, you know, air travel is a real problem for for carbon footprint and stuff like that. Like, ideally, it would be great if we could do all this stuff electronically, and just like do, you know, remote attendance and, and telepresence or whatever. But I I just haven't found that as useful. Like I have Skype meetings with my colleagues all the time, but it's only when we're in the same room that we really make progress. And yeah. also, I, like yeah. like I've tried to, like I had a I organized a conference um, last year. Well, no, earlier this year in February, I organized a conference um, about dark matter, and a couple of the people I wanted um, to invite couldn't travel, and so we had them give a talk. Um, uh, remotely. And that worked fine in the sense that like we could hear them speaking and they could hear our questions and we had, you know, the slides all worked out like that. That was great. But we couldn't talk to them in the coffee breaks. And I, it, although I made the whole conference available for them to attend, you know, remotely for the whole time, it was, you know, it would have been 6 p.m. to, you know, 3 a.m. for them or something like that to attend. So the time zones, you just really can't do that. You have to be in the same place. You have to be in the same time. So it's it's very hard um, to do the kind of work that I do without traveling a lot. And I haven't found a good solution for that. Um, and People do occasionally say like, oh, aren't you worried about your carbon footprint? Like, yeah, I'm worried about my carbon footprint, but there's there's kind of not a whole lot I can yeah, do. Give me something that works. I'm yeah, yeah. I mean, if mm. I want to be a physicist. I, I totally agree. I'm in a you know, very different field to you, but, um, you know, in the, the field I'm in, I, I, I need that 
that interaction with people to give me the ideas that I that I then use to tell stories to help other people understand the concepts that I'm communicating. So it's that that interplay. And you're so right. I have the same issue with with this. I mean, Skype's good for this sort of chat. It works quite well because there's, there's almost a social element to it. But when you're when you're having um, business conference calls and so forth, it's kind of it's like that. It's that formal setting of the of the meeting which which makes it really difficult to to have those moments like as you said the coffee break things and stuff like that where you you share a glance you you catch each other eye over something and sort of yeah. make make a mental Body note language. that was clearly uh you picked up on that as well i'll have a chat to you about that later because that's something that that i'm i'm interested in that sort of stuff you just you miss all all of this layers of of, of communication that that people use, as you said, Ed, like body language and so forth, when you're when you're in a room. But I just totally, yeah. totally get what you're saying. Yeah, or even just like you know, when I was visiting my colleague in London, you know, I could just get up and write something on his whiteboard and say, "What do you think about this?" And then we could have a discussion about it. And that's you know, technically you can do all that electronically, but it's just it's just so much more mm. difficult logistically, and it doesn't it just doesn't work as well. So mm. yeah, I mean, I. You know, I try to reduce my carbon footprint in other ways. <laughs> it's like I don't have a car. I ride my bike to work. I don't eat meat. Like you know, all of these things that I know can can help. And I do all the you know carbon offset stuff that I can. But I mean, for now, if I want to be a physicist and I want to get my work done, I kind of have to travel mm. a lot, and yeah. I have to do that on airplanes. So I liked. Uh, I did like your tweet from earlier in August about the. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll read it back to you because it, it did okay. make me chuckle at the time. The travel I'm putting my body through right now is the kind of thing it'll bring up resentfully next time it's mad about something else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's been it's been like that for a couple of months. I'm right now. I'm 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 right now in this sort of stage of jet lag where, like, I've done really well with the jet lag this time because even though I came across from London on Friday, like I well I left London on on Wednesday morning and I arrived here on Friday morning and there, it took 42 hours to do the whole trip. Um, so like, you know, in theory, like my, my body has no idea what's going on, but I've been, I've been sleeping at night. Um, but then I was, but then, uh, Today I was at my office and like I thought I felt all right in the morning. I'm like, okay, I've totally kicked that jet lag thing. It's all good. And then at like 2:30 p.m., my brain was just like, nope. <laughs> I was just sitting. I was sitting in my office and I was like, I need to sleep right now. <laughs> so, so I'm not. I'm not completely a pro with the jet lag thing yet. I really do try, but it's uh, it's rough. And I, at some point, my body's just gonna stop letting me do this sort of thing. Well, if it makes you feel any better, I, I sometimes have that 3 p.m. I need to sleep yeah. right now thing when I haven't been traveling. Yeah. It's, well, yeah, it's that's, <laughs> that, that happens too. <laughs> well, hopefully now with your new position uh, as a professor, you'll be more settled down perhaps and you won't have to deal with it quite so much. But yeah, I suspect we're um, going to see you flying around a lot still. <laughs> So I, uh, I, I've gotten, so the first semester when I, when I get there I, from January until, um, Northern summer, I'm going to have, uh, I don't have any teaching responsibilities. And, um, and so I've, I've gotten a few invitations to things and I was like, oh, I'm not teaching. I can go to that. So I've already, I've already somehow managed to schedule like a week in DC. And then, um, I got invited to speak at a thing in New Zealand and they were like, yeah, we'll fly you out. And I was like, okay, Uh, (laughs) Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to be, uh, going to New Zealand for a a few days and I've got, I'm giving a talk for a thing in Nebraska. Uh, and, uh, I think I'm going to be in Arizona for a couple of days as well. So there's still some of that happening, but most of it doesn't involve oceans. So that's, Mm. that's an improvement. Yeah, well, yeah. If you're flying to New Zealand, you might as well pop over a little bit further and come to Melbourne again and catch up. <laughs> well, I'll I'll see what I can do. But, um, I de- I'm I'm definitely going to be stopping by uh, Auckland and working with some colleagues there as well. So you know, it'll be it'll be as much you know one of these kinds of work visits too. So that'll be good. You didn't go over with Cos- Cosmic Shambles, did you? You I know you did Australia, but you you didn't yeah. go to New Zealand. Is that right? No, yeah, no, okay. just just Australia. Yeah. Hmm. That was that was fun. I really enjoyed that show, by the way, the Melbourne yeah. one that we saw you talking at. Oh, Lots thanks. of fun. 
Yeah, it was really cool. Um, I just wanted to ask you, just regarding the the talk, because you you know you do a lot of you pop up all over the place, and it, and it's always it's always a, a nice surprise when I'm listening to one of my many you know podcasts that are in my streams. Like, and and we're joined by Katie Mac. Oh, yay! <laughs> <laughs> Katie's on, cool. So I I heard you. I, I I'd got behind on Science Versus a little while ago, and um, mm. a couple of months ago you popped up there, and you kind of yep. you, you you seem to be a, a bit of a darling of the. Uh, the podcast uh, world, so we're very lucky it's, to get you on. <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of amazing. I've been I've been getting a lot of um, invitations lately for podcasts that I listen to anyway, and it's just like it's very cool, you know. Oh um, shucks, it, <laughs> <laughs> and then others not so much. Yeah. <laughs> it's 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 nice. I, I I like doing podcasts. I like talking, so you know it's good. I, I enjoy it. But also, you're on TV, you're on radio, you're doing a lot of public speaking and that. Do you find, do you get nervous before, you know, big appearances and things? Or are you just so used to it now and it doesn't bother you for public speaking or something like that? Um, I sometimes, so it, it, it depends. Um, I get I get very nervous for TV. I've only done that a couple of times. And, uh, and TV is terrifying, especially when it's live. And especially when it's one of those live cross things where they, they put you in a room all by yourself staring uh. at lights and a camera, and then they talk to you in an earpiece, and you have to stare straight ahead at the camera and not move your eyeballs and try and listen to what they're saying and then re- respond. And that's really scary. Um, but uh, radio, I don't get too nervous about anymore because uh, it helps that nobody can see me. Uh, somehow that just makes it a lot easier and you can pretend you're just talking to the person in the room and it's, yeah, so that's, that's kind of fun. But, uh, yeah, for public talks, I, it depends on the talk and it depends on like the audience and stuff. Sometimes I get super nervous and sometimes I don't. And I always get a little bit nervous before giving like a science talk, like a colloquium or something. Um, but, uh, I do find that once I get going, it goes away. So I'm almost never nervous by the time I'm actually speaking. It's just, you know, beforehand. I I really kind of enjoy public speaking. This is something that I've only kind of recently noticed uh, that, you know, a lot of people are really scared of public speaking. And, and every, you know, I, I will get a little bit nervous, but I actually really, really like it. And being somebody who is not... Uh, you know, I'm not an extroverted person in general. I don't like being like, I, I'm not a showy person. I don't do the life of the party thing. Um, you know, I'm really very quiet in real life, but, uh, but I really like standing in front of an audience and talking about science. So I don't, I don't know. There's something, uh, that, <laughs> that circuit is flipped for me compared to most people. Um, but it's, I, I enjoy being in a, a, you know, a large room with lights on me. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think that's kind of fun. Um, well, that's I good don't because like, clearly the audience like you being that person yes. too, which is great. Well, it it it's usually yeah, it usually works out. But yeah, I was I was talking to a journalist about about this stuff recently, and I I said that I'm much more afraid of private speaking. So like, you know, if I have to talk to a stranger at a party or something, that is terrifying, and I'm really super awkward. But you know, put me in front of a room of thousand people, like awesome. <laughs> so I don't know. Oh, you're you're very good at it, and I uh, still remember watching you on stage with uh, Buzz Aldrin uh, talking about going to Mars and everything. So uh, I think you're a natural really at it now. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and getting back to all of this uh, travel side of things, when you have, I've seen you use the academic nomad hashtag a lot, which is yes. a very busy hashtag. It seems that that's <laughs> part yeah. of the course with academia these days. But when you're never in one place for long, like, I mean, you've only, you've been in Melbourne a few years now, but uh, obviously mm-hmm. you, you didn't grow up here or anything, and now you're moving yeah. back to the States and everything. That must really have a big effect on, on everything from finances yes. to relationships to all that sort of stuff, doesn't it? Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's super disruptive. I, you know, I, I often say like, I really like traveling and I really hate moving and mm. Uh, unfortunately, um, you know, academia requires both of those things. So the traveling, I don't mind, uh, you know, I mean, as we said, it's, it can be exhausting, but I like seeing the world and stuff like that. But having to pack up my life uh, entirely every couple of years and start over in every part of everything is 
can be a real drag. Like I've, you know, I, I started, I grew up in Los Angeles and then I went to Princeton for grad school. So I moved across the country for that. And then I moved across an ocean to Cambridge University for my first postdoc. And then I moved, you know, around across another ocean to Melbourne for my second postdoc. And now I'm going to move back to America. And it's, uh, you know, it's each nuts. of those moves involves, yeah, each of those moves involves like packing your whole life and losing all of your friends in terms of like, you know, in-person interactions anyway. And, uh, you know, if you had a relationship, like it's not going to happen across an ocean. So, uh, so there's that as well. Um, I mean, some people manage to keep, um, to keep relationships going across oceans, but, uh, that's not something that I seem to be, I've never had a situation where I've done that. So it's, uh, it, it can be really rough. Um, it's, it can be hard to, you know, leave your whole life and just carry your career along with you, you know? You must be getting very good at the eBay thing of just selling everything because I'm packing <laughs> up and moving. Uh, I just, yeah, I have, if anybody in Melbourne needs furniture, uh, do get in touch. <laughs> I also have a washing machine, a fridge, toaster, a uh, nice, nice power of electric kettle, like everything you might have in a home, like let me know. Um, yeah. I need to get rid of it. Good luck with that. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> the, the science on top uh, community yeah. notice board. We're here to help. Anyone? You can keep, well, they can contact you directly. I, I, they don't need to go to us. Yeah, that's yeah, that's I mean, fine. Yeah. Craigslist charges for that sort of notices. <laughs> uh, but I mean, it's it's a you know it's an issue. Like I was, mm. I actually um, my uh, my my landlady um, had uh, had somebody come into my apartment this afternoon to look at the apartment because they might be moving in when I move out. And, um, and I was trying to convince him to buy my furniture when he takes the apartment because that way I don't have to <laughs> don't move just it. Leave it here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. But unfortunately he didn't take very much. So, uh, yeah. So, so I have a lot of stuff like that I have to sort out. And then like, you know, shipping things internationally is massively complicated and, mm -hmm. um, and difficult and just packing things is awful. And, um, yeah, and and then you have to you have to find you know new friends. You have to find a new place to live. You have to figure out like what your routine is going to be. Um, I'm probably going to have to buy a car when I get to North Carolina because people need cars there. Um, so it's yeah, it's really disruptive and um, it's it's tough because sometimes you like where you're living. You know, I really like living in Melbourne, and um, I'm sure that I will enjoy Raleigh as well. But it, you know, it's it's a big change. So it can be challenging. Mm. I have, is this an area? Sorry, I'm not quite familiar where you're actually from in the U.S. Is this, is this anywhere near? Did you say L.A. is where your family yeah, is? I'm from, from, yeah, I'm from Long Beach, California. So Right, um, okay. Close to Los Angeles. So it's oh, not, right, okay. it's the other coast. Um, mm. But I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be spending a couple of months in L.A. on my way to the new job. So I leave here at the beginning of October and I'll have like two and a half months in LA and then I, then I move over to North Carolina. So I'll have some time with family and, and to just sort of take a breather before starting the new yeah. job. A well-deserved yeah. breather, I think. <laughs> yeah. And so we mentioned, but we touched on relationships a bit then, and mm -hmm. we, we talked before the show, I'm, I'm not outing you here that uh, you're okay <laughs> talking about being queer. Um, yeah. How accepting have you found the scientific community about that in general? Has it been an issue or has it been pretty good? You know, I think th I think that uh, the scientific community tends to be pretty left winging, wing left leaning in terms of like politics and and fairly you know accepting of a lot of uh, different things. So you know, I, I don't think there are many people um, in my field who are particularly bigoted or anything like that. Um, I'm sure there are some, you know, there's always horrible people um, in, in every sort of sector. But, uh, but you know, I, I haven't seen a lot of that. Um, but, the you know, the thing that's interesting is that people tend to just not talk about their personal lives. So, um, you know, so like in my department, I know that, you know, I know that a number of people have, you know, partners and children. Um, but, uh but nobody really talks about, you know, 
mm-hmm. orientation or anything like that or or any any of those kinds of things like they kind of just don't come up and so i was um i was talking with somebody for another podcast recently um and uh it came up that uh i i have no idea how out i am at work because um <laughs> Because it does, you know, nobody asks me about like my dating life or whatever. Um, and, and the thing is, it's actually incredibly difficult to be out as a bisexual who is single. Because like, okay, like, let's say I were gay and partnered, I could be like, and this is my partner, and she is a woman and look, therefore, you know, like, that's just yeah. like, clear right clearly i am not straight i have a partner who's a woman like that's you know that yes. that kind of thing is is very easy in that sense i mean you know i'm not saying that it's easy to be to be gay or anything like that i'm just saying like you know you can you can just point to like here's another person you can bring them up casually in conversation um as somebody who is who is uh, not partnered and somebody for whom bringing up a partner would not actually clarify <laughs> my orientation yeah. um it's it's really hard to bring up like i think and i think it's also like it's also hard to bring up because like the only way to do it is to say i am bisexual yeah. and that is not something that you want to say at work right like there's just <laughs> That's a I bit don't know. random. It's just, yeah, I mean, or, but even like, yeah, I just asked if of, you wanted a coffee, Katie. Right, <laughs> right, exactly. It's it's re- it doesn't come up in conversation. You and you know nobody is talking about like, oh, you know, what kind of people do you like to date? Like that is not a thing that happens. And and also, you know, words like like lesbian or or gay, they don't actually have the word sex in them. <laughs> something particularly awkward about having to say bisexual you know like there's this kind of like it's like it's just too much it's not appropriate for a workplace conversation and and so anyway so the point is that I just have I just have no idea um if anybody at my office knows that I'm queer because how does how does that even come up and that's uh fine but it's also a little bit strange because um I think that you know there's sort of this default assumption that everybody is straight and there's then there's some kind of like you know uh default straight culture that goes with that and um mm. it it's just a, it's just a little bit odd to to feel like there's this part of my life and identity that just never comes up and people might not know about and I'm not ashamed or anything but I can't you know, but I, I just don't talk about it. But then a friend of mine gave me this amazing gift, which is a coffee mug that says it oh, has I like a little, yeah, 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 it has like a little rocket on it and a planet, and the and the coffee mug says um, certified space bisexual. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That it's is amazing. So awesome. It is super cool. And so I've started like just I so I I took it to work and I've started to like drink my tea out of this thing and just like. <laughs> just like hold it there (laughs) and like and i've been watching and i've been watching people's reactions and trying to like see if they look shocked or like (laughs) and like nobody's nobody's blinked at all like there's there's they're all had they have perfect poker faces and i have no idea (laughs) but it's it's kind of hilarious so it's it's kind of a double-edged sword like there's there's the good side of it which is my orientation and sexuality is not an issue it's nobody's business necessarily and no one is there to judge or anything. But at the same time, it's a part of your identity. And it also yeah. means that, you know, meeting people that you might want to have a relationship with is so much more difficult. Because well, no one you know, quite I'm knows not, where you stand. So. I'm not trying to meet people at work. Um, no, no, no. That's, I'm just saying. That's not, but yeah, but I mean, like, yeah, like it's if somebody wanted to like set me up with somebody like it wouldn't, Mm. but you know, again, I'm leaving the country. So that's one of the things about being this sort of itinerant worker of a, you know, a postdoc is like, there's, there's kind of no point in trying to meet people because I'm leaving. So anyway, so that's dark. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, yeah, yeah. it is. I mean, it's, it's a bummer, right? Like when I, when I was in, Cambridge I was I was seeing somebody and then I moved to Australia and that was about as far as it was possible to be away from Cambridge and so that ended and it was kind of hard and so I thought like I so when I got here it was only a three week a three-year position 
And so I was like, okay, fine, I'm just not going to get involved with anybody because if I do, then I'll have to leave and then it'll be, you know, difficult. So, um, and then the three-year position turned into a five-year position. So I've just been kind of mm. not, yeah. yeah. That's that's hard because it starts to turn into yeah. significant, you know, periods of your life then. Like five years is not a blink. Yeah. That's, I mean, you know, right. I go on dates and stuff, but like there's no point in getting really involved with anybody. So, yeah, I guess but I, can, I can imagine. I can imagine how that. You know, the, in, to, in the back of your mind all the time, it's a case of, yeah, there's no point in pursuing anything. That, that yeah. would be hard, I reckon, because it's not yeah. like you people often set out to meet someone that they think, I really want to pursue something that could be a long, long-term long thing with this person. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I really feel for you. That's that's actually hit me. Yeah. <laughs> Ouch. I mean, it's, it's, it's okay. Like, I have other <laughs> good things in my life. And, you know, and I, I do, I do date and stuff. And it's not, I'm not a total, like, you know, hermit or anything, but it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it can be, it can be sad, you know, to, to just not be in a position where I can think in those kinds of terms. And one of the nice things about starting a, a potentially permanent job um, is that I mm. will be, I will be able to say like, you know, this could be open-ended, right? Like yeah. I could actually uh, think about, you know, the future potentially, yeah, if, yeah. you know, if I'm lucky enough to be in a situation where I'm, you know, where that, that even comes up, but yeah. you know, it's, 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 it wouldn't be something where like every relationship I might think about pursuing is, you know, explicitly doomed on a particular date, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, because yeah. that really does put a damper on things when you have that situation. Well, good luck. I hope it works out for you in uh, North Carolina. Thank you. And uh, thanks. Uh, I I think we, we were the plan was that we were going to start talking about dark matter and the universe and all that sort of stuff, but we've just been talking all about your amazing awesomeness so far. So I'm I'm okay with that. Uh, yeah, I'm totally okay with it. <laughs> uh, I, I guess maybe I I think I may have already asked you this before anyway, but I always lose the answer. You call yourself a theoretical astrophysicist and uh, also a, a particle physicist what's the difference between all of those and a cosmologist and th it seems like that's a yeah. big sort of mishmash of everything yeah yeah so okay particle theory is you know when you study like the fundamental like physics of the universe particle interactions things like that astrophysics is when you study things like phenomena that happen in space um you can be a cosmologist in either of those fields. Um, so a cosmologist is somebody who is interested in like the beginning of the universe, the end of the universe, the evolution of the universe over time, uh, the evolution of the stuff in the universe, but also potentially like the ultimate nature of the universe or, you know, the shape of the universe or like, um, you know, the dimensionality of things, like all of that stuff can be under cosmology. And so, um, so you can go to a cosmology conference uh, that is mostly particle theorists, and then it'll be about things like, um, like the uh, you know ex higher dimensional theories. It'll be about like the the Big Bang and exactly what happened in the period of inflation, or or some alternative thing that happened you know in the first tiny fractions of a second or it might be about black holes and the nature of space time within black holes or the ultimate future of the universe or anything like that like there's you know cosmologists in particle theory and higher energy theory um, might go into that kind of like extreme physics stuff um, a cosmologist in astrophysics might think about things like uh, the evolution of galaxies or the first stars and galaxies in the universe or um, how the 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 gas between galaxies has evolved over time or the first stars uh, and what, how we can find out about those. Um, or they might be talking about, you know, the first light, uh, the cosmic microwave background and what you can learn about the universe from that. So, so there's, there's a huge range of things that a cosmologist in either of those kind of sub-disciplines might think about. And I'm a cosmologist who... Uh, sort of stretches across those sub, sub disciplines, and so I'm, I'm somebody who um, 
who talks to particle physics cosmologists and also astrophysics cosmologists. And I'm a cosmologist who is kind of in both camps. So I think about a lot of those different things. I think about dark matter and, um, you know, what the universe is made of and what, what happened at the very beginning and, you know, whether there are higher dimensions of space and how black holes work and, um, you know, uh, the evolution of galaxies and what you can see with radio telescopes. And like, so there's a whole range of things um, that I work on, but they're all in the, in the umbrella of cosmology in both of these kinds of subdisciplines. Is that, is that at all <laughs> helpful or is that just really You're Totally confusing? clear now, Ed. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. <laughs> Basically you study everything from the very yeah. small particles to supermassive black holes and the shape of the universe to the yeah. milliseconds after the big bang to what happens over billions of years it's it's yeah okay yeah. straightforward and simple cool uh, did <laughs> well, you I always mean, yeah it's like the thing is like the all of those are all about like trying to find the ultimate nature of reality basically i guess and different ways to approach that and they're all like these really weird interesting systems so I think that my my interests um, are a little broader than most uh, people in my field, um, but that's just because I, you know, I get distracted by really extreme <laughs> problems a lot, and I should probably Ultra focus curious. more, but I I don't, so <laughs> I just work on all sorts of things. That's cool. You, you're obviously very passionate about it. Did you always want to be an astrophysicist, cosmologist, whatever, or was it like just astronomy kind of pulled you in and then you got into the bigger things? How did that all come about? Um, I, I got into it through physics more than through astronomy. So, you know, a lot of people in my field, um, they grew up stargazing and then, you know, they transitioned from that to to doing astronomy and then, you know, got into physics and stuff. Um, I grew up in Los Angeles uh, area and you can't see anything in the sky most nights. <laughs> you can see a few stars, Um you know, there's there's very little in terms of stargazing uh, aside from like you know Hollywood. I was so, so going to make that joke. I'm glad you yeah, did. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I couldn't I couldn't help it. Um, so you know, so I I really can't, got into it through physics. I wanted to know how everything works, and um, and I liked the sort of big mind bendy questions. You know, so I learned about you know like uh, Stephen Hawking and the brief history of time and um, these ideas about black holes and space time and time travel. And I'm, I was just fascinated by all of those things, like the stuff that really, you know, trips you up in the head. And so I wanted to learn about that stuff. And I found out that Stephen Hawking, his job title was cosmologist. And so I was like, I want to be a cosmologist. Uh, so I went about it through that. And, um, and then, you know, I went to to college and I learned physics and then I went to grad school in astrophysics and um, eventually found myself working in cosmology. So that worked pretty well. <laughs> Most people don't have quite so direct a path. Um, but uh, for me, you know, I think I was probably 10 years old or something when I decided that cosmology would be a fun wow. thing to do. And I've just kind of kept going with that. That's very awesome. Yeah. It, it's something that needs a lot of maths, I'm guessing. It's quite a complicated mathematics, in fact. Is that true? And were you always good at maths? Or is that something that anyone can develop? So I, I was really good at math um, in like elementary and middle school. And then I went to high school and my math program wasn't that great. And I uh, stopped being as good at math. So when I went into Caltech... Um, uh, they put me in like the remedial math class <laughs> during my first year. So, so at Caltech they have um, they have a math class that's called Math One A, which is like the introductory math class, and then they have a special section of Math One A that they call Math Point Nine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was in, I was in Math Point Nine, so. You know, I think that that a lot of people think of math as being this thing where, like, you have a mathematical brain or you don't. Mm. And it's really not like that. Like, if you practice, if you have, you know, uh, good classes or if you, you know, work on it and, and um, you know, make an effort to learn it and, and use it a lot, then you will be good at it. And if you don't do that, then, you know, you, you'll have more trouble. So 
I always tell people like, you know, study a lot, um, practice math. It's like learning a language. You have to practice it and then you will get good at it. And so for me, you know, I had a lot of catching up to do when I was in college, but, um, you know, I've, I've been able to get by. So it's, uh, yeah, I mean, there is, there is a lot of math in theoretical physics because, uh, you know, all we're it's doing the in theoretical physics. physics really is, yeah, we're just, we're just building models of the universe out of math and trying to match them to what we see. So that's, you know, so the math part is super important, um, much more important than the ideas part. I think that that's a misconception people have that, you know, that we just like sit around and think like, oh, maybe the universe is shaped like a football. And then, you know, <laughs> and then we're like, oh, that's the important thing. That's not the important thing. The important thing is like, okay, how do you test this? What's the mathematical structure? Is this a consistent theory? Like, you know, what's the data? How does it fit with that? Um, those are the important things. And so the mathematics and the, you know, the, the, real, you know, work of it is, is the important thing. Just, just having the conceptual ideas is useful. Um, but it really doesn't get you anywhere unless you can connect it to measurable stuff, to math, to, um, you know, a, a sort of consistent framework and connect it to all of the knowledge that we have in the field already. And so it's, it's much more, you know, uh, it's much more involved than just sort of sitting around and having ideas, which I think is a lot of what people think that theoretical physics is all about. So where should I send my theory about uh, what the universe mm -hmm. is really made of to? <laughs> <laughs> Do you uh, get a lot me. of those sorts of things? <laughs> oh my God, so much. <laughs> um, yeah, I think uh, I get I get emails um, from people about their personal theories of cosmology. Um, maybe, uh, sometimes it's once a day, sometimes it's like twice a week, but it's really frequent. And I have, you know, I have a thing on my website saying, do not send me your theories. I won't read them. <laughs> um, but, uh, but so people send them to me anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting though. When I, when I do look at these emails, which is, which is rare, um, I mean, I'll look at the email, see it's somebody's theory, and then I'll put it in a special folder. But when I when I actually read through them, sometimes you know it's interesting because it'll it'll kind of make it clear like what what the misconceptions are that people are getting about about physics, and and usually what's happened is that there will be some analogy that that people use to talk about like black holes or to talk about space time or whatever, and usually what happens is somebody takes the analogy too literally and then builds some idea around that and they haven't learned they haven't learned the actual physics they've they've just learned the the story you know um and and then they they take that to be too true and then they extend it logically to some other thing and then they find you know an inconsistency with something else that they were told as a story about physics and then that's you know that's a breakthrough right and um they'll send it to me to say like you know is this isn't is this a good idea like does this make sense am i just going crazy or you know have i figured something out and um you know and and i'm you know i feel for those people because i know that um you know, I know that they, they really do care and they're really interested yeah. in these topics and, you know, they've they've been somehow misled. But, but there's also like a massive amount of arrogance in that because they, they're they assuming that, that they can jump into this field that takes, you know, years of study and just like have a thought and then they'll revolutionize everything because the, the professionals haven't, haven't configured, haven't, you know, thought of that. Um, and they don't, check and they don't do the the work to to learn the stuff properly and so you know i i feel for them because i i, I know that like perhaps they were misled by some bad explanation or something but at the same time um you know the level of sort of contempt for actual scientists and the level of self-regard you have to have to email a professional scientist and say i've solved this thing is that it's kind of a lot, right? So, um, I think so. It's, uh, I think part yeah. of that is also that we have this stereotype, no, this concept, I guess, of this mm. maverick uh scientist yeah. that, like, you know, yeah. Einstein was just a pattern clerk and then he discovered relativity, right, right. sort of thing. Uh, yeah, that, that we ha and I know you actually wrote about this for the conversation uh, mm. a few years ago, I think, that yeah, that these rare individuals who 
strike out and do amazing things are so rare and most of it is collaboration and yeah. hard science so yeah i mean like einstein when he discovered you know when he developed relativity and stuff he was a graduate student i mean he was working at, at the patent office because he didn't have funding or something like that but he, but he was a, he was a graduate student and he had an advisor and he had he was in contact constantly with other physicists he wasn't on his own, you know, like he wasn't just sitting in a back room, um, you know, writing stuff down. Like he, he was very, very plugged into the community and very well trained and very, you know, uh, you know, access, uh, he was able to access um, all of this uh, work. So, yeah, I think people do get a little misled by this idea that um, that all it really takes is somebody to have a new idea and to you know, to get excited about it. And then they can send it to a, a physicist and say, Oh, is, is this the answer? Um, and, and it doesn't, it, you know, it, do, it just doesn't work that way. The chance that, that somebody who has no training, um, who isn't embedded in the field and doesn't hear what the new ideas are and, and doesn't have that background, the chances that they're actually going to come up with something that's, you know, useful is, is, is tiny. Um, and even if they did like, just the idea doesn't do any good. Like it, it's mm. just saying like, just having a conceptual idea is, is useful if you can put it in the context of, uh, you know, a mathematical framework of a model something like that, that's useful. And if you can do that, you should publish the paper, but sending it to some physicist who's getting piles and piles of these every week is, um, you know, there's no possible way that I could evaluate these things and actually respond to people. Um, because then I would end up being their personal, you know, physics consultant. And that's just not a, a that's just not a service I can provide, you know. So um, I feel bad, you know, just filing these things away and never answering because I know that sometimes um, people are just, you know, they're just excited and they just have this enthusiasm and they want to explore it. But um, it's it's just not something I can do. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's it's I can imagine that you're a target for some of this just because of your profile. You're you know you you are socially engaged, but so you you're an easy one to sort of approach and because they can reach yeah. you, they can put a name to you and say, "Hey, I've yeah. got this idea." But I guess it's yeah. different when it's children at schools and they've got an idea. Then you want to. Oh, sure. It's a whole different yeah. conversation. Yeah, I mean, if 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 a kid asks me a question in real life, that's that's different. Hmm. But yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, people who are not in the public eye get these emails too. A lot of people will send their theory to an entire department ma mailing list, for example. Um, one person has been emailing recently, and he 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 writes in his email that he sent this email to seven thousand physicists, and only one person replied. And <laughs> and like, that was an out of not... office response. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think. <laughs> I think that one out of those 7,000 people actually, like, decided to have a discussion with him, but, like, apparently right. didn't go the way he wanted it to, and so he's writing right. again to everybody. Trying another 6,999. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's sad, isn't it? You, 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 as you say, you, you, you've got this dichotomy of, on one hand, you, you know, at least they're, they're interested, but on the other hand, man, it's misguided. And, and as you said, it doesn't matter what your field is, you've got to do the work. You've got to put yeah. in that foundational work to be able to then, you know, have those discussions. And, and yeah. you know, we say – I see the same things um, in in business to some degree, but certainly with people who think that they can – they they they're just needing that one big idea to become, you know, a, a great, you know uh, – you know, at the next, the next Facebook or the next that. It's case of yeah, but those guys, again, those people who had those ideas were backed by knowledge and experience and stuff that they had learned, so that they could actually follow it through to fruition, rather than just say, "I've got a great idea, give me the money." Where is the money? Yeah, I mean, some, sometimes people. Uh, I've, I've heard the analogy of like you know going up to a you know an award winning author and being like, okay. Here's the here's the idea. Just write the book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You just do that bit, and I'll come yeah, on the yeah. tour with you. Just do the publicity, and yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, I and I, I do. You know, I am aware that that you know, telling people like, oh, you should just go to grad school. Like most people can't do that, right? And like most people can't um, go and and get a degree in physics and then get a PhD and then you know publish papers in in professional journals like that's that's not something that's open to everybody and and it sucks that that's not open to everybody and i i wish that that we were able to you know 
make things more accessible and and I do try in whatever way I can to advocate for um to give more people access to um to science and to to science education but in the meantime like if if for whatever reason you you really can't um put in that time and and that energy um then you know the chance that you're actually going to be able to contribute is is you know on the level of like coming up with the next new theory is is small i mean there are other ways to get involved in physics and and to contribute to science i mean like citizen science stuff you can do amazing things um but in terms of you know new theoretical physics ideas uh unfortunately it it does just take quite a lot of work and study i mean i i went to grad school for 5 years and i've been a postdoc for 8 years and so that's what it's taken for me to to get to a point where you know i can publish papers and this sort of stuff but yeah. yeah you know somebody who who does it you know every night and weekend um that's great but it's probably you know it, it, you you need the environment of you know you need the mentors you need the colloquia you need the classes um you need the 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 real training for the most part mm-hmm. i've heard some other um uh, you know, scientists and and uh, academics and so forth talking about that. Well, c- certainly explaining that th- their observation is that this anti, you know, this distrust of of um, uh, of specialist knowledge and you know, distrusting scientists, distrusting um, the people who have done their the work experts. seems to be yeah. The ex- exactly. It's 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 almost. I don't know whether it's a. Uh, it's fueled by media or the the access to information that people have now that's unparalleled in mm. human history that they can just yeah. go and they can dig up enough that they've got the the right words to use a lot of the time but they you know and they yeah. they can sound like they know what they're talking about i'm a great example of this um <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but but they really you know they know nothing john snow they are just yeah they, uh, but they think they do and that's the, that's the problem it's yeah uh, yeah that can be that can be hard um yeah i mean i've i've read about studies about things like science literacy and media literacy where you know if you if you give people training and tools sometimes they will assume that means that they don't need to they don't need the experts and the and the actual expertise um because they can just do it all themselves and so and there's there, so there's a sort of tension between you know, empowering people with with information, but also making like making clear what the limits of that information really are, and um, and I think that's that's something that as as a science communicator, when I talk about physics, I try really hard to make it clear where I am making an approximation and where I'm making an analogy, and um, I try and make it really clear that you know sometimes I might be. So telling you something that is to give you a good idea, but it's not the whole story, and you need to know that it's not the whole story because otherwise you might be misled into thinking that um, you have uh, some knowledge that you that you don't yet, you know. And and it's it's sometimes hard to communicate that, but I think it is very important um, so that people realize um, the limits of that knowledge and aren't aren't misled into thinking that um, you know that they they have some deeper understanding than, mm. than you've communicated, you know? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Well, we're all going to eat our words if it turns out it is turtles all the way down, though. Uh, <laughs> I think we need to let Katie get back to packing for her next trip. Uh, Lucas, did you have anything else that you wanted to run by? I'd like to hang out with Dr. Carl. <laughs> uh he's he's really interesting he knows a lot of things he does. um so, <laughs> yeah it's 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 interesting to talk to him because he's just an, an unending you know font of of trivia yeah. and uh and so it's and he's got a huge amount of energy so yeah he's he's about you know it, talking to him in in person um uh one on one is about like listening to him on the radio like his that that kind of enthusiasm <laughs> really? and energy and knowing all the things like is 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 definitely you definitely still get that when you talk to him in person i mean oh, you know he doesn't cool. he doesn't know everything about everything but he knows a lot about a lot of things so yeah and that's the thing and just like you were saying he's 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 careful to explain you know briefly that that he only he often talks about working from pr- first principles and it's like i know a little bit about this so i can extrapolate but you need to do the work you know, don't don't take what I'm saying as 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 gospel. Yeah, yeah. 
I have I have nothing. I, I won't take any more of your time. Yeah, I feel like we could talk for hours, but uh, uh, Dr. Soon-to-be Professor Katie Mack, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, as always, you've been a fantastic guest. Thank you. It's been it's been great talking to you guys. Um, uh, I, I should I should say one thing. Um, I will be doing one more public talk in Melbourne um, on the uh, the twenty third. I think. Let me just um, let me just check and make sure. It's at uh, yeah. It's on the twenty third of September. It's at the Astrolight Festival at Science Works. And um, I'm gonna I'm gonna be on a panel. Um, there will be an astronaut on the panel, among other people, and um, I will also be doing a, a half hour talk. And I think the talk is gonna be about um, different ways the universe can end. So that should be that should be cool. fun. I, I'm cool. a little bit worried about that because it's it's during like the family time part of the night, and I'm hoping that um, the children are not too. Um, horrified by uh by my subject matter but i'm gonna try and make it light and cheerful so uh, anyway well, my, so my yeah. kids I, I i read uh phil plates uh death from the skies to all of my kids and they all enjoyed oh, it quite young so that's a good sign okay okay good good <laughs> um so this this show might not be out yet by then but we'll make okay. sure that we we tweet and things about it yes for sure okay cool all right and you our our, our Twitter followers are not quite at your 180 years thousand <laughs> level, but uh, you know, we'll do our best. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for having me on. It was it was fun. Um, I it's it's weird to just talk about me, but um, but I, I I hope that people are interested at some level. <laughs> oh, see how that totally. could not I, be. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, uh, so was, obviously, awesome. thank you so much. <laughs> obviously, Twitter is probably the best place to follow you on the internet. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Astro Katie on Twitter and um, astrokatie.com is my webpage that I should really update more often. Yeah, um, yeah. You need to put your there's job also, there. Yeah, there's also, yeah, um, uh, there's also, I'm on Facebook at um, facebook.com slash Uh I've, I, I put stuff on that very rarely, but occasionally I will put things there. And, um, uh, and I have a column in Cosmos magazine, so um, that is also called Astro Katie because uh, that's what they decided because to call brand. it. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so that's uh, you can find uh, my stuff in Cosmos magazine and on the web at the Cosmos magazine website. Fantastic. We'll try and have all the links to all of those in the show okay. notes and uh, on the site. Cool. Once again, Great. thank you very much. That was terrific. Thank you. Thank you.